wanted to talk to you about the, the landscape of our world today through the lens of the Bible. Many times, uh, and rightfully so, people have grievances with the Bible because it's been used as a tool of oppression. It's been used uh, to get other people's agenda across, but that's not its intended purpose. And many times I've noticed that uh, as students come in, they want to know how much Bible do I have to take at Union? And I think that you offer an interesting perspective on, on how to read the Bible uh, to begin with. Would you like to talk to us about that whole perspective on as history? Yeah, so you raised several hard questions at once, um, but really important ones, ones that are always on my mind. The, the irony of the fact, first of all, just just say, it is kind of a disappointing irony that in our current kind of popular consciousness, people really worry that the Bible is a source of oppression. Uh, they, they worry rightfully because it, it has been used that way and we can document the, the cases, what verses, what issues, and it's, it's a sad history. But you invoked the word history and something I find sort of exhilarating about getting out of the present with an eye in the present, but stepping out of it momentarily is you enter this world where you, first of all, you look at these documents which even people who grew up going to church don't know as well as they think they know. They're always shocked by what they find. And your first thought will be, oh my gosh, these sound revolutionary. And not only do they sound that way, but let's go on in history. What have been, even as recently as the 18th century, 19th century, what were the big gripes for the people who hated Christianity Think of a, of a major figure like Nietzsche. Nietzsche's complaint was, this is a morality that favors the underdogs. And he thought that was disgusting. Now that's a straightforward reading of the Bible. What he hated about it <laughs> was that it lifted up, in his words, the scum of the earth. Those aren't his words, I'm sorry. Those are Paul's words. When Paul talks about, this is, Paul sort of proudly says, you know who we are? We're the scum of the earth. We're the off scout. So everyone can laugh at us. I don't care. I have a trans valuation. What God cares about is not what you all care about. And I'm not using your value system. Well, Nietzsche looked at that and recoiled in horror and said, I want a master, a master of humanity of great artists and only the fit and the healthy. It was kind of almost an idea of evolution that what happens if we, if we preserve the weaklings and, and the broken, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll hurt our race. And there, I would just say, I agree with you on your reading of the Bible, Mr. Nietzsche, and I disagree with you. I side with the Bible. I am proud of those values. I'm proud of this celebration of God taking what's viewed as dirt and saying it is through this that I'm going to upend the world. And, and it should be added that in the, in the countless ways that the ancient Jews and Christians, and I'm only speaking about those and not other religions just because that's my, I teach Bible and I do the ancient world. They were ready to thumb their nose at really dominant long-standing cultural practices and values and that terrified people and rightly so and and the christians did upend the world in many ways and so it's a, it's a bit tragic that the texts and the movement that that led to uh you know roman governors saying if these people continue to spread, they will destroy our society and our economy. They're that radical in their politics, in their economics, in their gender values. They let women, I mean, one of the very first pagan comment we have about Christians is a letter from Pliny the Elder, a Roman governor. And he says, their women are called deacons. He uses that word. He knows they have, their women lead. That's creepy and makes me uneasy. 
um, this is going to up turn over good Roman values and good Roman order. And I think I would say, good, yes, turn it over. Um, so it's a pity that those texts and that movement have somehow been so perverted in the popular imagination that they stand in the way of revolution anyway. And, and maybe that's the, the point is that they do need to stand in the way of revolution for those who do not want revolution. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and it's a revolution at so many levels. It, it, the ancient people who first reacted with horror at Christian scriptures, what became Christian scriptures, were learned elite philosophers who were in some ways sincere people. Actually, I like them. I like Greek philosophy, pagan, secular Greek philosophy. But they said, these writings um, are, are the words of commoners. The prose itself is not elegant. They really cared about this elegance of, of word choice and grammar. And so the very Greek that was the kind of Greek we would speak on you know, in, in casual conversation, even that offended them. But to most of the Christians credit, rather than saying, no, no, it's actually very good Greek, they, they actually just said, you know what? We're gonna take that fact as a datum about the God of the cosmos. And we're going to conclude, interesting, some, for, this surprises us too. The God of the cosmos has chosen to communicate in the patois of commoners. And what does that tell us? And, 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 and so even like a, a church father, one of, in our union-y language, one of the bad guys, Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin, said he had a, he had a nightmare where, because he, he was raised on good Latin prose, you know, and purity of language, and he's an intellectual. And he went off to live in a cave in, in Bethlehem so he could learn Hebrew and translate the Bible. And he said one night he had a dream and God said, I think you love Cicero more than you love my word. The, the point being, he, he's like, oh, his, his own aesthetic snobbery was still there. And, and he was cut to the quick. Like, yeah, I, I need to let go of that aesthetic snobbery because it touches on a deeper set of values that are inimical to the underdogs that these scriptures I'm translating want to lift up. So, so I say like there, how much are we talking in the current moment about aesthetics? We think of that as like what goes on in art galleries, but it's, it's not. It's also like what types of language, what types of voices are celebrated as proper, adequate voices? And so for me to connect something I do, I'm here in my office and I live in the ancient world and I feel sometimes very disconnected. Uh, and yet there at the very level of Greek grammar, the things that are wrong with the Greek is theologically and politically relevant to a transvaluation of aesthetics. It's, and that, I don't have to connect the dots for you, that does speak to the present moment. Like, what voices should be raised up? That tells us something different. Interesting uh, that you talk about aesthetics and it not just being how we dress things, but, or something that goes into art gallery, but really how we adorn our everyday lives. What's beautiful. Sorry, go ahead, I cut you off. No, I'm just saying that the way that we adorn our everyday lives, things like our language. And um, I even think about the t-shirts the that people are wearing, the graphic t-shirts are a way of aesthetics of maybe that's your protest, um, which is very insightful. It makes me now want to go read more on aesthetics. But uh, I wanted to ask you about, um, I know that you have taught overseas before, uh, that you taught in Australia. Um, Teaching the Bible, did you, I mean, give us some background on Australia just a little bit, but also about teaching the Bible there. So it was a culture shock for me. I, I taught um, at Yale Divinity School for nine years. And then my, my contract was coming to an end and I looked for jobs. And so it wasn't like I was looking to live in Australia. I uh, was offered a couple of jobs. One of them was in Perth in Western Australia. And I took it a little bit out of a sense of, I guess, adventure. Why not? Why not go live in a very different place? And 
the, among the things that were very different about teaching there, one, I wasn't teaching at a divinity school. It wasn't at the graduate level. I was teaching some graduate students, but I was mostly teaching sort of intro courses in the humanities at a state secular school, right? A public university. So just like you would, whatever, go to Michigan State University and you, you take your history class, you take your intro to Bible as literature class. I was teaching that kind of class to that kind of student. And Australia is much, much more secular than the United States is. So there are, there were vastly fewer people who had grown up maybe sometimes attending church or with a cousin who went to church. I mean, it was much more like for me to teach the Bible there would be like teaching the Bhagavad Gita at Michigan State, where a lot of the students would say, okay, I don't even know what continent was this written on? What are we even talking about? Um, and frankly, I found that kind of liberating. I mean, it was fun because the students didn't know up from down. And they all came in with kind of an attitude that like, I'm sure this is stupid and something we've transcended. And that was fine with me, it didn't bother me. And it just meant we got to start afresh and dive in. I was like a tour guide. Um, and, and actually, I think in some ways it made me a better teacher because I couldn't assume any knowledge whatsoever, not knowledge about the ancient world, not really knowledge about history or ideas. They're just under, they were undergraduates. Um, and so that forced me to speak. I, I've always um, aspired to present even hard ideas in plain language. I, I don't wanna, I wanna make things as clear as possible. I had to go even further in that um, to explain ideas for them. And, and, and also, I mean, there were just funny moments because although there aren't that many religious people in Australia, there would be, my people would take the class who were kind of fundamentalists, if I can just say that, and so they would feel very awkward because they would feel like I was not teaching the Bible with the reverence it deserved. I was teaching it just like it was a book. Um, and it took a little bit of work with them to see that, to teach it just as a book, to engage it in that mode was not to devalue it. Um, it was one mode and it didn't have to be the only mode, but that it gave us a common language for them and their classmates to engage on equal footing. And if I can, some of my happiest moments were, actually I find this even here at Union, that somehow engaging with this ancient text that as I said, is foreign to everyone, even people who know it kind of from growing up. One of the fun things that happens in seminars is it, it destabilizes all of us in a really refreshing way and people get out of their boxes so I can remember once in Australia, we were having a, a mock debate where I was trying to, I said, okay, I'm gonna divide up the class. And some of you have to, we took a famous um, controversy in early Christianity where the apostle Paul and some of his folks were arguing against other believers in Jesus who were more of a traditional Jewish orientation. And they had a really legitimate disagreement. And what I did is I put some of the more fundamentalist Christian students on the Paul side. That's the winning side of the debate, according to the Bible. And I said, you're gonna argue his side and some of the other students are gonna argue the other side because I want you to enter into why, why there really wasn't something to argue about. Because for these students, I think their first thought was, Paul said it, it's in the Bible, clearly that was the right answer. And that missed some of, the drama that these were hard decisions and they weren't sure what God, what, what way was God leading? Like, that's a hard issue. Okay, so anyway, and so I helped both sides prepare for the debate for about 10 minutes. And I said, you know, just think about it. You're gonna use Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament scriptures. Everyone agrees that's an authority. You're gonna use these various other, what Jesus taught, because everyone by definition, if they're followers of Jesus, they care what he taught. And in about three minutes, as I'm going to the two sides, kind of giving them some help and pointers, the most stubborn fundamentalist kid who thought I was disrespectful to the apostle Paul at times, he turned to me and he said, we're gonna get killed. 
And his point was like, if I have to argue Paul's side, like he's got nothing. He's got no teachings of Jesus to go with. He's got no clear scriptures. And he's like, why did Paul even win? And then I felt like, ah, I've got him. Like now he's curious. And I haven't asked him to say, Paul has a weak argument. I've said, you make, re remake it, remake Paul's argument and see what you think. And he was like, this, this is hopeless. And then he was curious for the first time, genuinely curious. So why did this argument win? And it wasn't just like, I'm going to side with the Bible because the Bible says it won. And then he was curious about the history and about like how his own faith and his own doctrines had come to take shape. So it was a very long answer, but I think it gives you a little flavor of like what was kind of fun about the moment. And as that class went on, I've had the same thing here at Union. You'll be having a debate. We, I just had to talk the gospel of Luke. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm kind of pitting Jesus against his opponents from the gospel. And I'm saying like, no, let's flesh this out. And all of a sudden, you know, one of our Jewish students here from across the street at Jewish Theological Seminary, he's a rabbinical student. He's got his keeper on his head. And he and one of our atheist students are teaming up to defend Jesus because they're like, no, no, he's right. He's right. And, and there's someone who's a Baptist on the other side of the room who's like, no, he's not. The, the Pharisees are clearly right in this case. Jesus isn't being fair. And like, that's fun, right? Because now no one, everyone's forgotten. Oh yeah, I'm an atheist. Oh yeah, he's Jewish. Um, it's just like, we're in the text and we're making new, you know, that's something I love about it. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I love about Union. Um, and thank you for highlighting that when I took my Bible class there, when I was a student, my Bible class had an atheist. It had uh, Jews, it had um Muslims who had come from international places. We had uh, Asian Indians, we had Dalits, uh, the untouchables. It was so diverse. I mean, we had then, you know, Pentecostal, foot stomping, hand clapping. Exactly. And it was such a rich conversation. And I have to say that the most that I learned about Christianity was from the atheist. Totally. I mean, what, and, and here's the other thing I would say is, is kind of fun about that. If I was to name, there were only 12 students in the class, that we, the one I'm just thinking of, we also had a Nigerian woman, an Indian woman, a Chinese man, um, gay and straight, one trans person. And here's what I think was kind of refreshing is that day one, we're used to what are our markers of diversity? And it's my ethnicity, my skin color, my gender, et cetera, right? Or my religion. I'm an atheist, and, and what was kind of fun was that by, by week two already, those weren't, those weren't the markers that were relevant as we were mixing it up with the text. We built enough friendship and trust pretty quickly that all of a sudden consistently, it's uh, like I said, oh, the atheist and the Jew, I sound like I'm telling like a setup for a joke, arguing with the Baptist and the Chinese and Indian and Nigerian making a, uh, you know, disagreeing with each other and, and, and denominational things. None of those things were the issue. Um, and so, yes, there were insights coming from all over the place uh, that, and weird sympathies would emerge. And that was kind of fun because it, it felt like, oh, for when we're here together, there's different diversities that we're talking about or feeling. Um, you know, I remember one person saying it was like the last day of class and she was talking about her wife. I, I hadn't known that that woman was gay. I mean, it, it just hadn't come up. She'd talked a lot. She'd contributed a ton to the class, but everything, and, and from her life even, but like that wasn't the piece that mattered to her in her engagement with scripture. Um, it wasn't like she was like hiding. It was just like, there was these other things about her life she wanted to bring in to her discussion. So I, I thought that was like, I think we all found it kind of refreshing. Yeah, I'm just sort of pausing here for a second because the sirens are going in the background. I'm gonna wrap with uh, one more question about um, classes here at Union and what people are used to as maybe like indoctrination or kind of Bibles. If I'm coming to your class, wow. Um, if I'm coming to your class, how? How do I approach it? Because there are these diversities, there are, you know, all of these different types of people there. What should I expect coming to your class? Like that's you're gonna ask it um on tape? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so let me see stops. What, what, what? Right, so it sounds like the Union is an amazing place. I think the Union is an amazing place. Um, and it doesn't seem like that coming to one of your classes, I'm being indoctrinated, but that there is a sense of community and we are truly wrestling with uh, the times and this book that we know as the Bible and all of that. So what, what can students expect with coming to one of your classes? Yeah, it's certainly not going to be indoctrinating. Um, that, that will be the furthest from your worries. Uh, honestly, the thing I most crave in students is uh, just a bit of curiosity. Um, it, I think the, this, the texts are unexpected at every turn and it just takes that willingness to listen and say, oh, oh, here, here we go. Here's a parable. It's going to say such and such about God. And then it takes a weird twist. And you're like, oh, what a strange thing for someone to have said about the deity. And you can say that whether you believe in the deity or not. It can just be a hypothesis. Like, huh, I didn't realize there were theists who thought that about this being that I don't believe in, but like, that's interesting. Um, at, at the same time, I guess I should say, maybe this will surprise people, but if anything, I think it's sometimes, it, it can be the students, sometimes our international students coming from a little bit more traditional background with the Bible who find our Bible classes the most challenging. I don't think, I can't imagine there's ever been an atheist or a Jewish person or a Muslim who was like, oh, the Bible class made me uncomfortable because I thought it was too religious. That's not an issue. I think what can be hard is for people for whom this is their sacred book, they feel like, oh, we're we're not treating it with the reverence it deserves. And that I think is probably the issue that comes up more often. I, by saying that, I hope to one, allay any fears of someone who thinks they're gonna be indoctrinated, they're not. But I wanna address that, I mean, because I, I really do think there are some modes of engaging that allow different people to take away different things so that um, if, if, if I am a, a Jewish student, I can just say, oh, you know, I've always kind of heard that 19th century Judaism really became fascinated with Jesus just as a Jew, of, as an ancient Jew, as part of our heritage. I never knew why that was. What is it about? You know, what do I like and what do I not? And so it's just interesting. And, and yet then at the same time, from the same material for someone who's preparing to be a Presbyterian minister and will have to preach on some of these texts to say, oh, you know, that really insightful thing my atheist classmate said will forever change the way I preach on this aspect of Jesus. Um, because at least in my class, I don't, I don't think there should be anything that eliminates the, the ability to use these texts for sacred purposes. Um, we will be engaging in a way that's comfortable for someone who has no desire or need to, to, to use them in that way, but that is also fully valuable to someone to use them in that way. And, and so really, I try to, it's one reason in, in my classes, we bring a lot of different modes of engagement in by which I mean this, this past semester, we read ancient narratives about wonder workers, holy people, so that we could see, enter the ancient world and see what did someone else, if they heard about Jesus, for certain issues, they just thought, oh yeah, he sounds like Apollonius of Tiana. He did similar miracles. He also, whatever. And then we read, so that's ancient. Then we read modern short stories that were inspired by or stirred up by the text, the ancient text we were reading, so that we were sort of also thinking about narrative, storytelling, but then thinking about the weird ways these texts have percolated um, into different hands and what, through brilliant modern short story writers, what sparks did they take? And so they sort of blew these sparks into a, their own fire. And it can help to say like, oh, wow, I barely noticed that in the Gospel of Luke. But now that I see, um, this Borges short story, I see this whole, gosh, you're right. 
here's this element and here's a Latin American author doing a kind of postmodern macabre reading, but I can see how it came. So for the person who's merely curious, it's just cool to know that uh, a literary figure like Borges took inspiration from this text. For the, for the Christian person who wants to use Luke and preach it and take theology from it, they may say, oh, I now see something in my own sacred text I didn't see before because I see it through Borges's strange and brilliant eyes. And I'm gonna, I have a new little uh, discovery thanks to that. So, so I guess one reason for these different modes of engagement is to decenter us and let us all hear a lot of different voices so that our diverse students who are going on to do different things, you know, can each take something else away that will be useful for their ministry, for their academic work, or for their own just personal, you know, psychological, spiritual life. That's my hope. That's sort of my, that is my prayer actually um, for these classes is I don't want to speak. We don't want a univocal thing. And, and that's one reason to bring in these different readings is to avoid univocity. And I think if anything, we, you know, we end up with, with babble with a lot of voices, but then, then there's sort of moments where it settles and you, we pull out threads. So, yeah. Well, thank you. You really painted a very authentic and exciting um, picture of what your class is and what union is like, uh, just in your conversation. And I can sense your, uh, your conviction and your excitement about it. So um, to all students who are looking and when it comes to registration time, please look out Dr. Holton's, look out for Dr. Holton's classes. They are engaging. He is this passionate about teaching, uh, <laughs> even in the classroom, not just for this video. So I encourage you all to check out those classes. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Holton. For thank chatting. you, Carmen. Uh, I look forward to meeting the new students. Yes, this has been another edition of Inside Admissions. I am Carmen Michael Smith from Behind Admissions for Anytime. Thank you.